I mean, I was thinking how, not annoying, but I guess how frustrating it must be to <laughs> constantly be categorised for 30 years as Oprah's other half, when, in fact, you've been a very successful man in your own right. This is one of many books you've written, and I love your books because they're the kind of empowering leadership-style books that I think we need out there in this kind of increasingly snowflake world. This one is great because it's about leadership, but I've got a problem, Stephen, and it's this. Your central premise is that pretty much anyone can become a leader. They can evolve into a leader. I'm not sure I agree with you. I think leaders are born, not made. Persuade me otherwise. Well, uh, you know, identity leadership, uh, which is the name of the book, is, is really self-leadership. Mm -hmm. It's based on the philosophy that you can't lead anybody else until you first lead yourself. So everybody has to first lead themselves. And that's kind of hard to do because when you talk about self-mastery, the world's not set up for you to lead yourself. It's basically set up for you to be a follower. You know, most people, they wake up in the morning, they wash their face, they brush their teeth, they get something to eat, they get the kids out to school, they work all day, come home in the afternoon, they spend time with the family, they watch TV, they go to bed, maybe they dream. Uh, and they repeat that same cycle over and over. So if you did the same thing you did yesterday as you would do today, as you would do tomorrow, what have you done? Nothing. And then we have a, a, a system now, an educational system that basically teaches us how to memorize and take tests, repeat the information back, get labeled with a grade, and two weeks later we get the information. So we don't actually learn anything. So basically nothing from nothing is nothing. So the most important thing in terms of the 21st century, which requires you now to be skilled, requires you now to have some you know, self-direction, requires you to be a lifelong learner. Uh, you can't do that the way the system is set up. Mm -hmm. And so you basically are not going to be empowered, and pretty much you're going to be left behind. And that represents about 6.9 billion people in the world <laughs> who are basically consumers, workers, um, and, and followers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I call them slaves. And so the ability to be able to take your power back, know who you are, define yourself based on your purpose, based on your passion, based on your skills, based on your talents and abilities, is really the only way you can be competitive in the world today. We are obsessed, I think, at the moment with leadership politically. We've just been talking about the race to be Tory leader, mm. the next leader of this country. We've just had an outstanding example of leadership in Owen Morgan, the leader of the England uh, cricket team which has won the World Championship. And over in the States, of course, we've just been discussing the tactics of your leader, President Trump. What do you think are President Trump's qualities as a leader and how do they reflect or perhaps offer a black mirror to what you're talking about? Well, I, I, I was, I, I'm a former military person, uh, serving the US Army a number of years. Uh, I love my country. I, I certainly... Uh, I'm not a, uh, here to bash my president. Uh, uh, I, um, I'm here to really t teach people and also present a process, a nine-step success process, which teaches people how to self-actualize their potential so they can uh, have influence based on who they are, wherever they are. You know, first starting with themselves, then with their families, and then with their community and with their organization they might work for. So. To me, um, you know, there's a process for that and that people do the best they can based on, you know, what they can do, what's possible for them. The value that you give yourself is the value the world gives you. The world sees you as you see yourself. So I'm trying to eliminate uh, labels. I'm trying to eliminate uh, gender labels. I'm trying to teach people that it's not how the world defines you, it's how you define yourself. And there's a process for that so that you're not defined by race, you're not defined by family, you're not defined by job, you're not defined by title, but you can be able to understand how to take information, education, make it relevant to the core of who you are, transfer it to your mind so you become a thinking human being and understand how to take information and make it relevant to developing a process of continuous improvement mm -hmm. in the 24 hours that you have every single day, which is what makes us all equal. Okay, Everybody has 24 Stemmen. hours. OK, so, see, I, I think there are other things that define people's lives. One is uh, great love. 
you know, historically, great love can define people, right? You have a great love for... Well, a... actually, it's one of your... When you talk about the, the characteristics mm. of successful people, it's, it, it, you talk about having deep relationships, that, that the, the characteristics of the people you're talking about tend to have more profound interpersonal relationships than others, feel a deeper empathy, and that with benevolence and affection... No, the reason people. I raised that, Stemma, was your uh, other half, Oprah Gate, did me an amazing favour. I went to... Uh, the CNN America. I was trying to find a big booking for my first show, <laughs> and at the last minute, Oprah agreed to do it. And we had this incredible interview. She was so warm, kind, fascinating. One of the great experiences of my career, certainly. Because I used to ask everybody that question, that love does not involve, actually, having your heart hurt, and you'd never done that. Oh. Well, the, you know what? It's a beautiful thing you just mentioned. You, you, you talked about love. Love really is a transformational uh, word. You can't transform without love. And so love is the foundation for organizing everything that you care about, organizing all of your passions, organizing everything that you're capable of doing, looking at the glass half full as opposed to half empty. So most of our problems in the world today is based on anger, it's based on rage, it's based on negativity, and it's based on hate. And so being able to understand how to transform your own personal and professional development and, you, and, and with love as a way to organize everything that you would like to aspire to creating and developing and building, you know, your potential is based on love. So if we could just get people to transform into a loving mindset, create loving energy, organizing things that they're good at so they, they can be productive as opposed to focusing on trying to tear people down mm -hmm. and dealing with wars. And so leaders, you know, who are angry, who are negative, you know, I mean, that's probably, I mean, that's a detriment to our society. It just takes one person to really kind of destroy the world. Well, uh, Oprah said, Oprah was one asked... person to destroy an organisation. Right, Oprah was asked um, about why you two had never got married uh, in 2016. She gave a really interesting answer. She said that the one time she brought it up with you is when I said to Stedman, what would have happened if we'd actually gotten married? And the answer was, we wouldn't be together. And she said, we wouldn't have wow. stayed together because marriage requires a different way of being in the world. His interpretation of what it means to be a husband and what it would mean for me to be a wife would have been pretty traditional and I would not have been able to fit into that. I thought it was a really interesting answer. Yeah, I thought, you know, she's absolutely right. I mean, I, I travel around. I had two million miles on one airline, you know, <laughs> so... And then she travels all around the world. And, and so, you know, you wouldn't... It's hard to have a marriage based on that, you know? I mean, uh, so I... I think she's absolutely right, and we've talked about that. So, um, but it's, you know, we've been together a long time, and mm -hmm. we love each other and care about each other, and, and it works, and I support her 150%. I want her to be the best person she could possibly would you be. Like her, would you like yeah. her to be president of the United States? Because many people look at this democratic field in this desperation to try and stop Trump get, getting re-elected, and they look at Oprah Winfrey and they think, you know what? She might be the one who has the star power, the force of personality, the widespread appeal in all parts of America that could stop Trump and win for the Democrats. Well, I talk about her in my book, you know, as a, as a um, identity leader. And, I mean, here's a woman that um, came from Kosciuszko, Mississippi, came from an abused... Uh, situation growing up, a lot of trauma, uh, came from a very tough background. I mean, where in Mississippi, you were, you know, it's almost impossible to get out of that, raised by a grandmother, to, to a person that owns her own television show for 25 years, number one, has her own network, has her own magazine. You know, of course, she's a, a person that has the qualities to be able to run for president. You know, she is, uh, you can trust her. She's, uh, she's one of the greatest communicators in the world. Mm. She is uh, self-made. Nobody gave her anything. 
and she understands the American uh, free enterprise system and how it works, and she cares about people, and she has empathy. So, I mean, you know, is it the right move for her? No, it's not. <laughs> Why? Uh, can Why she is do... it not the right move? You well, just made the most compelling do... argument I've ever heard. Because, because she can do so much more behind the scenes because she doesn't have all of the controls politically. Mm. You know, she's not divided by parties. She has the ability to move in and out all different circles. So, for, for, you know, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for her to run, run for presidency because she can do so much more. Final, final yeah. question for you, Stedman. Um, I asked Oprah this. I'm going to ask you this. How many times have you been properly in love in your life? Well, several. Uh, a few times, I would say, yes. That's, that's good enough. If, you, if you've done it three times, you, you, you're, you're doing pretty good. So you've been in love three times in your life? That I would say so. And what is the secret of enduring love? 33 years of it. Oh, man, that's a great question. <laughs> the secret is... Let me give you the secret. The secret is learning to love yourself. <laughs> Susanna's writing this down. And going, and, and, and going down and unpeeling... Going, and peeling the layers of the onion back to where you can find out who you are and be happy with, with your own life. And when you start to begin to love yourself, you can begin to love other people. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to organize everything around your life, you know, uh, around love. Because the foundation of my existence growing up in a family with uh, two disabled brothers in my family, growing up with low self-esteem, a lack of confidence in myself, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to find out who I was, it took me all of these years to begin to understand Oh, it's not. If you're looking for freedom, you'll never find it on the outside. Freedom is only on the inside. So I'm looking at, for freedom in all the wrong places, and I realized I had to reverse that process, and then I could take love as a foundation for my existence and begin to organize information and education and make it relevant to who I am every single day so I can improve myself so that I'm more open and kinder and have more empathy and because I care so much for myself. And that's, that's the secret. That is an amazing answer. So basically, I need to learn to love myself a little bit more, Stebbin. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you're, I think you're doing pretty good. Yeah. <laughs>